Okay, go ahead, Kamal. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of March 11th. I'm Kamal Ji Singh from Haridwar University. Uh, Sebastian Geiger, also from Haridwar, and myself, we are both are delighted to host you this week for yet another excellent lecture. Unfortunately, Hardy couldn't join us for this session. So today we have the pleasure of hosting Ryan Armstrong, who is an associate professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, in Australia. Ryan holds a PhD and BS degree from Oregon State University. His research interests are multi-phase flow through porous media with applications to enhanced oil recovery and special core analysis. He specializes on the usage of microfluidic devices and dynamic X-ray microtomography experiments to study the pore scale physics relevant to subsurface engineering technologies. He has worked on various projects ranging from microbial enhanced oil recovery to alkaline surfactant polymer flooding and to digital core analysis. So previously, he was a member of the rock and fluid science team at Shell Global Solution International, where he worked with Shambhaje Moscow Research on a collaborative research project that assessed pore scale modeling tools for digital core analysis. So Ryan has more than uh, 57 publications and he has given wonderful contributions to our understanding of digital core analysis, digital rock physics. Uh, he also holds various leadership roles at uh, different organizations. So it's our pleasure to host you, Ryan, today. Thank you for accepting our invitation and joining us uh, today in our studio. And to our audience, please note uh, this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by question and session and discussions. And like always, please type in your questions in the chat box on your right hand side. So the Sebastian can highlight them uh, in the, after the talk in the discussion session. So Ryan, so we are looking forward to uh, hearing your lectures. The stage is yours and thank you once again. Okay, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen here. And I will note that um, there's a bug with the Mac. So when I go full screen, I don't think you'll be able to see my cursor. So during the presentation, I'll just try to direct you all to um, what I'm talking about as being on the right or left of the screens. Um, so anyways, um, let's get started. So once again, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And before I get started, I would like to acknowledge my various collaborators that have helped me with this work um, as shown on the screen on the left. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge my previous PhD student, Chin Hao Sun, that actually did a lot of the uh, work on the wettability um, research that I'm going to present today. Um, I would like to start um, by giving just a brief overview of the research projects that are going on within my group that fall within the topic of digital materials. So here we're using X-ray mag tomography to study the flow and transport processes in various porous materials. The projects range from looking at um, coal petrophysics to studying the um, morphology and characterization of minerals deposited in ores to looking at the dynamics of phone systems and the structure of membranes and fuel cells. But for today's talk, what I want to do is focus on um, digital rock physics, which falls within um, the petroleum industry's integrated subsurface um, modeling framework. So as I show on the screen here is all the sort of steps involved in building a reservoir model and the standard laboratory measurements such as capillary pressure, rope. Apologies prime. for interrupting, Ryan. We can't see yep. your slides moving. I don't know if you've changed slides. slides. Um, yeah, I, I have changed slides. You you don't see them? We just see the title slides oh. too. Oh, oh no, okay. Um, let me try. Let me try stop sh sharing and sharing again. Mm -hmm. 
So this was the digital materials slide. Do you see we still that? Don't see the, we still only see your title slides. Apologies to the audience for that hiccup here. It's the first yeah. time after nearly 50 webinars. Um, anything? I'm changing slides now. No. No. Um, let's see. Try something else. How about in this mode? Do you see this? No, it's now it's moving it's forward moving, yeah. as it should. Great. Okay. So yeah, let, let's try it like this then. Um so this was the digital material slide showing an overview of the uh, research projects that we have going on at my group. Um, and then what I want to do today is talk about um, digital rock physics. And this was slide showing the overview of the steps that go into building a reservoir model. And in particular, when we're talking about digital rock, we're talking about um, taking images of rocks and um, running simulations to estimate the cathode pressure or row perm, perm or porosity for these type of reservoir models. Um, so within that space, um, digital rock physics is not only um, useful for these sort of pragmatic uh, modeling platforms, it's also very useful for looking at the physics of multi-phase flow and porous median, in particular at the pore scale, where we can resolve the uh, interfaces between phases and start to morphologically characterize what um, is going on in the pore space. And what's critical for this type of morphological characterization is to have a set of tools necessary to define the geometry of complex shapes. And these tools come about as part of what's known as the Minkowski functionals. So these Minkowski functionals measure the volume, interfacial area, mean curvature, and integral mean curvature, or um, what results in the Euler characteristic that defines the connectivity of objects. Now, what's um, nice about these morphological um, measures is that they based on Hedwiger's theorem, we know that they form a complete set of all possible morphological figures needed to um, characterize a 3D body in space. Um, and also there's a number of other mathematical theorems that are built up within these type of measures that can be useful for understanding the relationships between different geometrical measures, which I'll show today as um, examples of work. Now, the last thing to note is that these morphological measures, measure, measures show up as the basic um, state variables in our upscaled multi-phase flow models. So the first Minkowski functional is basically saturation. Second one is a specific interfacial area. Um, and the third one, this beam curvature can be related to the capillary pressure in the system. Um, through the Young-Laplace equation. So in some of our earlier work, looking at um, these Minkowski functionals, we wanted to look at the capillary pressure saturation relationship. As shown here on the left, we can see the basic sort of relationship that you would see in the textbook. And you can see that for any um, given saturation, you can get a range of different capillary pressures based on the history of the system. Now, what we have on the right is simulation results from Castlegate Sandstone. Um, the first figure, do you, are you able to see my mouse now when um, I've changed this uh, display mode by chance? No, we still can't see your, your pointer. Okay. Okay, 
So in the center figure, we have um, mean curvature versus saturation, or basically the mean curvature can be thought as a capillary pressure. And we can see still, you know, a lot of different capillary pressures for a constant saturation. Now, if we look at a single saturation, um, which is the data on the far right, um, and we can look once again at mean curvature versus um, specific interfacial area, and the size of the dots here are the Euler characteristic in the system. And we can see that even for a single specific interfacial area, we can have different connectivity in the system. So with any one of these measures, we still get this type of hysteretic relationship. Now, if we consider um, all four of the morphological parameters, what we can end up doing is using generalized additive models to develop a multidimensional surface. And when we do this, we can characterize the uniqueness of this surface in terms of an R squared value or a GCV value. And that, that's shown here in these two figures. Um, now, the idea behind the generalized additive model is that um, based on um, some mathematical works of Steiner, which show that the any given Minkowski functional can be written as a linear combination of the other Minkowski functional. So in this case, we're writing capillary pressure or the mean curvature as a linear combination of the other three Minkowski functionals. And in this work, we, we looked at um, six different porous media systems and over a quarter of a million different unique fluid configurations. And what we find is that when we consider all four of the Minkowski functionals, the R squared basically goes to one and the GCV, um, the variance in the data goes um, to very low values. So what we find is that we can uniquely describe the capillary pressure based on these Minkowski functionals. Um, so then if we can describe capillary pressure based on the Minkowski functionals or this sort of geometric state function, this raises the question um, for some of our work on wettability is that can we describe a geometric state of wetting? Or can we generate some sort of geometric state function that captures the wetting properties of a multi-phase porous system? Now, to do that, what we need to do is um, develop a little bit of theory. And we can start with something that's known as the Gauss Bonnet Theorem. And what the Gauss Bonnet Theorem does is it relates the um, Gaussian curvature of any sort of 3D body with the um, geodesic curvature. So both the Gaussian curvature plus the geodesic curvature of an object ends up equating to the Euler characteristic or the connectivity of that object. Now the Gaussian curvature is measured over the fluid-fluid interfaces like shown in this um, Cecil drop here. So this is the red region and also measured over the fluid solid contact, which is the purple region. And the geodesic curvature, this is the total curvature of change over the contact line. So in 3D, um, the contact line forms a loop caused by the contact of the cluster to a solid region, or in 2D, it's just these uh, two yellow dots. Now, if we know the total curvature of the interfaces in the system, and we know the total bulk topology of the object, then um, we can actually get out the geodesic curvature from the gauss bonnet theorem without having to directly measure it. So if we know the other two, then we can define this region in the um, red box here as a deficit curvature of the system. So that's the curvature that must exist within the um, contact line or the three-phase contact line. 
So I'll skip over um, the derivations to get to this equation, but essentially what we can do is we can define a macroscale contact angle, which is equal to the deficit curvature of an object divided by the number of contact line loops. So this is a sort of the measure of how much um, geodesic curvature exists within the contact lines. And this gives us a macro scale measure of, the, um, of a contact angle. Now, an interesting aspect of this uh, macro scale contact angle is if we look back at the original work of Norman Morrow, where he looked at um, um, Cecil drops on surfaces and he measured the intrinsic contact angle. So that's the um, x-axis on this graph. And on the y-axis, he looks at the um, apparent contact angle. So the angle you get after the surface has been um, roughened and what sort of angle you would measure. Um, and he does this for both advancing and receding contact angles. So the advancing is the blue line and the receding is the green. And what we find is that this macroscopic contact angle that we define equates to the arithmetic average of both advancing and receding angles here. And um, the unique thing about this for this type of system is that it could give a mapping to what the intrinsic contact angle of um, the system is. Now, that, that's great for um, Cecil drops on surfaces, but once we go to real um, more complex porous media systems, we need to consider uh, a number of different things when we're um, looking at these contact angle distributions. Um, and in particular, when we um, look at the contact angle distributions that are reported in the literature, we see that there's commonly a very wide distribution of angles reported. Um, and if you look on the far right uh, of the figure, you can see this wide distribution of contact angles, even for a glass filter material, material that's relatively smooth and homogeneous. We still get a large distribution of contact angles. So what are we actually measuring when we do these poor scale angles? And to do that, we can look at a couple of um, simple examples where we can consider how the roughness, chemistry, dynamics and gridding effects influence the direct measurements of contact angles. So to start off, we can look at um, roughness on the left and chemistry on the right. So these are um, simulations conducted in surface evolver and we consider on the left a rough surface and the projection um, to the right of it is showing the three-phase contact line and the colors of it are mapping to the contact angles. So we can see that due to roughness, we get a distribution of contact angles um, in the system. And also if we consider a heterogeneous um, surface um, on the right, we can see that we also get this, this wide distribution of contact angles in the system. So if we link that back to porous rocks, we, we already know from previous work that yes, rocks are rough. And indeed rocks have uh, different mineralogical chemistry in them and also different uh, wetting properties along the surface due to um, or different components in the oil phase being deposited on the rock surface. So um, indeed in these sort of systems, we would expect some sort of distribution due to roughness and um, chemistry. Um, then if we consider dynamics, as shown on the left of this figure, we go back to the work of Morrow, and we can see that, of course, um, due to dynamics in the system, we can get a receding and advancing contact angle. Now in multi-phase flow systems due to capillarity, we often see um, advancing and receding contact angles occurring both during drainage and imbibition. So it would be expected that we could have um, 
in any of these micro CT images where we measure contact angles, uh, distribution of these different types of contact angles developing. Then lastly, we need to consider the gridding in the system. So with micro CT, we're working with a Cartesian grid of voxels and we're trying to measure curvatures and angles over um, a couple um, voxels in space. And this is inherently going to bring about um, resolution problems. So here we looked at um, the contact angle distribution in data for different resolutions of data. And we see that um, as the resolution gets lower, the, of course, the distribution of the contact angles widens, but also the average value shifts and it shifts towards more intermediate, what would be observed as more intermediate wet conditions. Now we can look at the gridding effect in more detail um, by just looking at a single droplet. So here in this image, we have three droplets, uh, sorry, the same droplet three times with different uh, gridding. And we can compare the topological approach for the theta macro that I defined earlier to direct measurement approaches where you walk along the three phase contact line in the data and you measure contact angle at each point. Now, before I um, explain the data in the bottom, if we just look at the images on the top, we can already see that as we go to a course and course of gridding, we still maintain the topology of the droplet. Even if with the coarsest grid, we still have a droplet. So an order characteristic of one, and we still maintain all the contact points in the system. Now, if we look at the droplets in terms of just geometry, we can see that we lose quite a bit of resolution of that three phase contact line when we go to a course of gridding. So we can already expect that these direct measurements are going to have some difficulty here. And what we see in the data is exactly that. So in the bottom, we have the um, macro scale contact angle and the parent angle um, for different grittings. And if we look at say the middle data, we can see that due to resolution, the macro shifts a little bit to the right, maybe from around 60 degree contact angles to around 63 or so, but the parent angle will shift from around 61 all the way up to around 71. And we also see a large shift at on the far right on the um, even coarser gridding. So these direct measurements actually end up having, from the data that we've looked at at least, having um, more sensitivity to gridding effects than using this uh, topological approach. So, so I've, I've introduced so far this um, topological approach for defining um, contact angle in porous media. And I've shown some of the um, different effects that can influence the distribution of contact angles. But I haven't really talked about what the utility is of using um, the sort of geometric state function provided by the Gauss Bonnet theorem. And what I want to do now is show some of the um, things that you can, interesting things you can do with the Gauss Bonnet theorem. So the first thing is looking at linking scales. So trying to link the poor scale to the core scale when we're looking at wettability. Um, so what, what I want to show in the following slides is um, a, a basically alternative approach to getting contact angle distributions. So on the right, um, we have the sort of I guess I could say standard approach because there's been a lot of papers published on this so far. We start with the core, we do a multi-phase flow experiment, image it, image processing, measure the distribution of contact angles directly. Now on the left is another approach where we use core analysis, typical core analysis to get the capillary pressure saturation data in the system. 
and then use uh, the geometric state or this geometric state function as shown in the bottom here, this Gauss bonnet theorem, where we say that the topology of the fluid clusters in the pore space stays constant, but the curvatures can be distributed between the different boundaries in the system. So either in interfaces or along the contact line and use that knowledge to um, equate a distribution of contact angles in the pore space. So for the prediction of contact angles, um, we start with the capillary pressure saturation uh, measurement shown on the left here for, um, I think this was for a drainage curve. Um, and this PCS data provides um, a distribution of the mean curvatures in the system. Um, through the Young-Laplace equation. Now, if we can assume that most interfaces in the system are axisymmetric, then we can translate mean curvature to the Gaussian curvature used in the Gauss bonnet. And what we can end up doing is we can produce a probability density function for the Gaussian curvature in the system. So that's shown over here on the right for um, the system that I'm going to present. And then we can assume that a cluster can sample this probability density um, function space um, as long as it still obeys the gauss bonnet theorem and maintains its topology of one. So each cluster in the system can sample that PDF and provide its own distribution of possible contact angles. So on the figure here on the left, we see um, the possible contact angle distribution for three different cluster sizes. And then what we can, can do is we combine these distributions into a single distribution. Um, and this is done by considering the frequency of um, clusters of different sizes in the image. So each cluster provides a distribution and based on its frequency, those distributions are put together. And that ends up giving us a prediction of what the contact angle distribution should be. And that prediction is shown over here on the right for experimental data and uh, sandstone rock. So we have the direct measurements and the prediction and you can see that um, it ends up working pretty well. We, we get pretty close to the actual distribution in the system. The other thing that this model predicts is that um, clusters of different sizes should have, according to the model at least, clusters of different sizes should have different distributions of their pore scale contact angle. So to test this, we went into uh, experimental data in a sandstone rock extracted um, 20 clusters of, uh, of each size here, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 voxels, and measured the average um, contact angle for those clusters. And we also see in the experimental data that the clusters that are larger in the system tend to have slightly smaller contact angles than the clusters that are smaller in the system. And um, what we believe this trend it, what's occurring in this trend is that these clusters are following this geometric constraint based on the gauss bonnet theorem. Um, so we didn't just test uh, one single sandstone system. We also ran um, OBM lattice boltzmann simulations on um, sandstone rocks with a uh, with different wet abilities. So here we look at a water wet case with a USBM index of 0.96. And we show the prediction versus the measured along with the, on the right, the quantile differences, um, or the percent difference in the predicted to the measure. And what we find is that we have less than 5% difference between the measured and predicted for this uh, case. 
We also considered a intermediate white case with a USBM index of about 0.1. And we find that we do get a slightly higher uh, percent difference between measured and predicted of around 8%. But the prediction is still pretty good. And, and we think this slightly higher error is due to the original assumption where I said we're assuming that interfaces are axisymmetric. Um, you know, there's, there's other published works out there from various groups showing that in intermediate wet conditions, the interfaces, not all the interfaces are axisymmetric. So we know that um, the assumption doesn't fully hold under this case, but nevertheless, it still gives you an estimate, I think, of the Gaussian curvature, um, possible Gaussian curvature distributions, and it still gives a relatively good a prediction um, less than 10% error between measured and predicted values. Now, what I want to do is go back and look at how the, um, the, the Gauss Bonnet theorem can be used along with looking at the internal so I want to look at the internal energy of systems, in particular, um, multi-phase flow systems, and consider the gauss bonnet theorem as a geometric constraint on those systems and see what type of wetting models we can develop. And in particular, wetting models where we have some sort of sub-pore scale structure that is influencing the pore scale or the apparent contact angle that we would measure. So, we can start off by defining the internal energy for a multi-phase flow system. Um, and then we can simplify this a bit further by considering a closed system, no PV work, and equating the entropy production and linking that to the minimization of the free energy in the system. So the equation on the bottom here is basically a statement on how the entropy is linked to the minimization of free energy in the system. And this free energy is linked to the change in the interfacial areas between fluid A and fluid B and fluid A and the solid phase in the system. So the next thing we actually need is some sort of equation that can interrelate um, the different interfacial areas in the system. So actually what this is, is back to the geometric state function. So this uh, um, function here that defines the topology in terms of the deficit curvature, Gaussian curvature and area. We can again assume constant topology and then we end up having a constraint on these different geometrical measures for a fluid cluster. Now, what we end up doing is we do a type of constrained optimization, or we use the method of Lagrange multipliers, where what we want to do is maximize the entropy, entropy production in the system, subject it to a geometric constraint. Um, after various uh, geometrical steps, we end up getting the equation shown on the bottom here, where the surface where we're basically saying that the surface energy of the system must decrease. Now, um, we can consider a exact system, so like a Cecil drop, and plug in to um, the deficit curvature and the interfacial curvature values shown in the bottom of this equation here for the Cecil drop. So we define uh, equations up on the top left in order. We have the deficit curvature, the interfacial um, curvature between the two fluids and the two different um, interfacial areas of the fluid fluid and fluid solid. We plug those values into our relationship and what do we get out? We actually end up getting out the Young's equation for um, contact angle in the system. So what we can see is that, you know, looking at max entropy and using this geometric constraint, we are able to bring about the 
um, wedding uh, model um, characterized by Young's equation. Now, um, various surfaces are not um, smooth or homogeneous as defined in um, Young's model. We can have different sort of effective contact angle models. Um, three common ones are shown here, the wicking state, the Winslow model, and the Casey-Baxter model. These are used for um, rough surfaces. And each model um, is developed in a slightly different way, depending on how the droplet wets the surface. So in the wicking state model, the um, fluid in the droplet actually wets the entire surface and wicks forward along the roughness of the surface. In the Winslow model, the fluid penetrates the roughness below it. And in the Casey-Baxter model, the fluid droplet sits on top of the roughness in the system. Um, we can use the same steps um, as I showed previously with the Lagrange multipliers and defining these type of um, Cecil drop systems. And what we can get out is any of these standard um, wetting models. So Young's model, Wenzel's model, Casey Baxter, or the wicking state model. And in each one of these systems, uh, we see that um, it's either uh, the roughness of the surface or the area fraction under the droplet that essentially augments the intrinsic contact angle in the system to what you get for the apparent contact angle. So um, the roughness and the area on the surface ends up playing a large role in that uh, max entropy energy minimization step. Now, we can look at these types of surfaces in a bit more detail and also consider the macro scale um, contact angle in the system. So here we um, run um, simulations using surface evolver again for a chemically heterogeneous surface as shown on the left. And then on the right, the green line is the um, measured contact angles along the uh, three-phase common line. And the, the, uh, the red um, line is the um, contact angle defined by the Casey-Baxter model. And the blue line is the contact angle defined by our um, proposed theta macro. And you can see that both our model and the Casey-Baxter model end up capturing um, sort of the overall behavior or uh, upscale contact angle for, um, for the system. Now, if we also consider a rough surface, um, as shown on the left here, along with surface evolver simulations, um, the same data format as the previous slide shown on the right, and once again, we see that this, our theta macro, um, ends up providing um, a very good representation of the contact angles that you would um, resolve directly along the three-phase contact line. Now, um, the interesting thing about the approach that I showed today is that we can consider various classes of different types of problems. Um, today I presented probably the, the simplest of cases we could consider, but um, we can also consider possibly as shown left here, curved surfaces or on the top uh, systems where we have ch changes in the pressure volume work or in the bottom here where we don't consider um, constant topology, but we consider like in real multi-phase flow systems, changes in topology as shown in the image, we have um, some flow occurring and we can have changes in the connectivity and new loops forming in the system as fluids invading. So um, what uh, is the current active area of research in my group is to look at these different various classes of problems and see if we can develop interesting wedding models that could be applicable for uh, more realistic, you know, multi-phase flow situations. 
Then um, the last thing I want to do is look at um, this theta macro in terms of a macro scale metric for a poor system. So trying to link more back to from poor to core scale in, in the system. Um, so we can go back to the problem of looking at the direct contact angle distributions in porous media and seeing that there's a really wide distribution and asking, you know, why do we have such a wide distribution occurring as, as shown here on, on the left? And what, what I want to show on the right is that this wide distribution can be linked to um, fluid clusters or the cluster population statistics in the system um, following or trending towards um, a geometric constraint. So I have experimental data for a sandstone rock and centered glass sample. And what I've plotted here is on the um, X axis is NC. So this is the number of contact line loops. And on the Y axis is the deficit curvature in the system. And each of these dots is for a different cluster in the system. And what we see in both cases is that the clusters in the system all tend towards the macroscopic contact angle, which is the slope um, of the line. So the best fit line to this data is the dotted black line. And the slope of this is four times the macroscopic contact angle in the system. So all these clusters in the system seem to tend towards this line. And also, if we look at a single collection of clusters, say, with four um, contact points on the solid, then we can look at the distribution of the uh, Gaussian curvature, sorry, distribution of the deficit curvature in the system. So on um, the, the upper uh, plots, you see the frequency distribution of deficit curvature for all clusters of NC equal 4 for both the sandstone and the centered glass sample. And we see that um, these frequencies tend towards a maximum right around where you would end up um, getting this theta macro value. And also we see that um, the dis differences in the distributions between the centered glass and sandstone. So for the sandstone, we have a relatively rough surface that's heterogeneous um, with you know, quartz and clay present. And we see a relatively broad distribution of the deficit curvatures for a single contact, um, for a single set of clusters of NC equals four. Whereas with the centered glass sample, we see a much narrower distribution of deficit curvature for this class of clusters. Um, and the centered glass sample is known, it, it's purely um, chemically heterogeneous and it's relatively smooth. So we expect to have sort of a narrower distribution of these values. Now we also, um, looked at the cluster population statistics for um, sandstone rock under two different wetting conditions. Uh, the, this was done with uh, lattice Boltzmann simulations by changing the uh, boundary condition on the solid surface. Um, but we also, from this simulation work, we also observed that um, the cluster population statistics in the system um, follow and tend towards this uh, geometric constraint set by theta macro. And we've evaluated for a system of theta macro of around 55 degrees and a more intermediate wet system of contact angle around 74 degrees. So um, what I was hoping to show today is first off, I wanted to define um, in terms of topology and curvature, how we can characterize the wettability of porous systems. 
and use that to develop a geometric state function for wetting. Now, this geometric state function can be useful, I think, for linking various length scales. So if we want to consider the internal energy in the system and how sub pore scale features to pore scale um, measurements and what the influence is between the geometric constraint and the internal energy in the system is resulting in a macro scale contact angle. We can use this geometric state function to do that. We can also use a geometric state function from going to um, the core scale back to the pore scale. So at the core scale, we can get capillary pressure saturation curves, make a few geometric assumptions along with the state function and predict pore scale contact angles. We can also end up going from pore scale to core scale where the geometric state function through theta macro is used to characterize the uh, trending of um, cluster population statistics and how they would behave in a complex porous media system. Now, um, as a part of this work, I would like to acknowledge uh, various funding agencies and various uh, infrastructures that have been used to support this research and also the uh, various people that have been involved in different aspects of the research. And um, I would also, anyone that's interested in learning a bit more about what I presented today, I would refer them to the um, following publications. The ones on the left is more around the geometric state function for the capillary pressure saturation relationships that I showed at the beginning of the talk. And then the wettability and topology work is presented in the three publications uh, shown on the right. Um, with that, I would, um, end and leave it open for any questions. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, for your talk and um, doing it so late you know, in the evening. It's started at 10 p.m. your time. It's now 11, getting close to 11 p.m. So really appreciate um, your, your endurance, and perseverance in speaking to us and taking the time. So we do have a number of questions coming through and um, start with some of the sort of technical questions referring to some of your modeling work and how you've done things. So started with Florian's um, thanking you for the talk. Quick question about your simulations. What capillary number were they at? Um, yeah, so for the simulations, um, I believe the capillary number of these simulations was around 10 to the negative five, 10 to negative four um, okay. for capillary number. <laughs> Thank you. I hope this answers your technical question. And we, Florian, we do have another question about just uh, the technicalities. Um, the I, that... may, maybe I would just mention that the, um, may, maybe the point there though, is that when we look at fluid clusters, so when we're doing the predictions and such, um, this, this is at uh, residual oil saturation and static conditions. Okay. So maybe that helps answer his question. Thank you. Um, Wilhelmine also thanks you for a very nice talk and wonders what kind of fluids did you use for your research? Do you think the measurements are representative for all kinds of systems, for example, CO2 or hydrogen storage replications? Um, yeah, so the, the exact um, contact angle measurements and so forth wouldn't be necessarily because, so we've used various fluids. Um, I'd have to go back, but we've used uh, decane and water systems and also air and brine systems for uh, most of the experimental work that, that I showed. And for the simulation work, um, with LBM, it's it's um, th those sort of parameters for decane water are fairly easy to simulate. So we also stuck to those um, viscosities and densities. Um, 
so yeah, we haven't looked at um, cases of supercritical CO2 or anything, but the theoretical developments and the technique um, could could be applied to um, more complex types of experiments. Okay, thank you. Um, moving sort of from the experimental, the details of the experimental work to the implication, slowly but surely. So we have a question from Zhang Zheng. Um, Again, thanking you for an inspiring talk. And um, the question is from a topological perspective. Can you comment on how particle shapes would impact the contact angle distribution? Okay, so I'm thinking particle shapes may be, well, I, I, I'm thinking of two things, I guess, here with particle shapes, maybe uh, referring to the shape of the grains in the rock system. I think so, yeah. So so in that, that case, um, if you wanted to do, I, I think that aspect would still be captured in the um, capillary pressure saturation curves. Um, so you, you the, the, that the actual prediction um, would still have the aspect of what sort of how these angular grains result in different types of curvatures in the system um now if if we're talking about different types of particles and fluid clusters of different topologies and how that could end up influencing the different contact angles that would result um that that's something that we're still um currently looking at is seeing how topology um, more complex topologies influence or result in different uh, contact angle distributions. Okay. Is there any scope, you know, um, so petrophysicists, um, they look with um, confocal, image, um, confocal microscopy, they're looking at the roughness and the type of different crystals that are growing. So they're, they're planning to use that kind of data that's, I understand, is available um, in, the, in the literature to to study how crystal shapes, different roughnesses in, in the way, say, a calcite mm. crystal grows, and how that could influence wettability? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good question. Um, and and yeah, we, we would be interested in using that in higher resolution techniques mm. to see what the underlying structure is, to give us some insight into maybe what structures or what sort of apparent contact angle um, model should be applied at the voxel level. So if we want to do direct simulations, can we relate uh, different structures and different intrinsic angles to different uh, petrologies or different minerals in the system? Mm -hmm. So then how can we go about distributing uh, apparent contact angles for, uh, for a direct simulation? Okay. Thank you. So apologies for sneaking in my own question here. Um, back to the questions from the audience. Um, we have one from, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Masashige, um, thanking again for a nice talk. And the question is, when comparing the distribution of the contact angle between simulation measured data, how do you evaluate the error? What if you do the same for that of cosine? Okay, so comparing... Um, yeah, I, I'm not uh, simulation of the dispute contact between simulation and measured data. I guess I'm not quite sure what it was meant there. Um, Maybe we can just quickly park um, that question and, and apologies if I mispronounce your name there, but Master Masa Shiga, if you're still online, and just sort of rephrase your questions, um, um, that might help us help Ryan to to sort of give you the provide the answer that you you're looking for. Um, going back to a question that Florian has made, sort of going to to sort of some larger scales. Florian wonders, in the context of the distribution of contact angles, is it fair to say that for poor network, assigning a contact angle to the network is tricky as it does not account for the geometric constraint? Um, 
I think, I, I guess, I, I would still say that really the geometric constraint we're just using to predict what the distributions of the um, contact angles should be, um, say for from the capillary pressure saturation curve. And, and really that work was to see if we could get a distribution that then we could use for um, direct modeling. So there's sort of, um, you know, th this, this sort of approach or also um, I guess what uh, Martin has shown as well using this thermodynamic contact angle. So trying to find what angle should be used in the network models. Um, and I think still you can use the contact angle in the network models. And because you, you are still having the contact angle as a, um, balance of forces basically right at the um, three-phase contact line. So the basic derivation of Young's equation just considers the balance of forces at the contact line um, for that advancing meniscus. So, so I think it, it would still be, uh, would be valid. Um, um, moving to, you know, staying so at the or to the continuum scale question. Um, this is something that I also want to ask myself um, when you were talking and essentially the same question. Yuang, um, thanks you for a very interesting talk. And he wonders, um, would you comment on how would the uncertainty of contact angle at the poor scale affect field scale modeling and predictions? So all the things that you're trying to find out of how how we quantify mm -hmm. contact angle, what drives a contact angle distribution fundamentally controls variability. How much, yeah. if you don't get this quite right, what are the consequences for the field scale? So we've, um, we've done quite a bit of uh, simulation work in this respect. I, I didn't present any of that, but um, we've looked at um, different uh, LBM simulation domains where you have a homogeneous distribution of contact angle um, in the system, or you have a um, distribution of contact angles in the system that follow different spatial correlations or follow the mineralogy in the system. And what we find is that we get uh, quite different relative permeability curves if you consider these different distributions of wettability in the system. So if the um, spatial correlation of say the oil wet regions is large enough that um, the oil phase can remain relatively connected even at low saturations, then you can get to a pretty low SOR versus uh, correlations that are more locally isolated and don't facilitate the sort of connectivity or generation of these minimal surfaces. So the, the relative permeability crossover point and the um, SOR that you get um, does change depending on how the contact angle is distributed and uh, what, what contact angle is used, of course. Yeah. Okay, so we have, thank you for, for answering the question. We do have, um, and apologies, I don't get the name right, Mr. Shiga's question rephrased. Um, so if the angle is completely random, the distribution of cosine looks flat through, the, through that of the angle, um, in terms of degrees, it looks like a cosine curve, I think. Does that help you to answer the question, Ryan? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I guess I can go back and just comment on when you're talking about the simulation or the experimental data for the comparison, what we do is we do the prediction, um, but then we also go into the data um, along the three-phase contact line and directly measure all the uh, contact angles that exist. So we're, we're comparing 
um, direct measurements on the um, 3D visualization to uh, predictive uh, measurement. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not quite sure if that answered the question. Maybe with the cosine contact angle, um, they're referring to um, this plot of theta macro versus the intrinsic contact angle and that S-shaped curve. So that is what develops the S-shaped curve in uh, what I showed was Norman Morrow's data. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they're referring to that as well. I think that's one of the challenges normally if you would do this in a face-to-face -face meeting, we could, you could have a much more direct discussion, draw out, um, get a piece of paper out and draw some curves and, and sort this out. So hopefully we can, um, hopefully this has answered the question. Maybe we can take this also offline um, if needed for and, um, and follow up separately um, to clarify this, this question. So we're, so we're running out of time, but there's one interesting question that I just want, it should be hopefully quick enough to answer. Um, Ahmed wonders, thank you, Ryan, for brilliant talk. What impact do you think applying subsurface conditions, um, high pressure, high temperature could have on contact angle and curvature measurements? If you go from the room conditions, standard conditions to much higher pressures, temperatures, would things change fundamentally? Um, so, so yeah, the, I mean, high pressure conditions and high temperature, the interfacial energies in the system would change. Um, so, so the, the angles that you measure and the curvatures that you get would be different than uh, ambient conditions, I think. Um, but in terms of the using the method um, to evaluate um, distributions and so forth, you, you would then need a capillary pressure saturation curve for high temperature, high pressure conditions um, with that, that right um, uh, um, behavior of the fluids in the system and the right compressibility of the rock. Mm. Um, and um, also, of course, if you are going into trying to do micro CT imaging and quantify wettability, when you look at high pressure systems, the, the sample hold and everything, more practical aspect, the images are going to be of lower quality. So it's going to be harder to, to measure anything. Um, so you're probably going to get wider distributions for, for pretty much anything you try to measure in terms of an angle. Okay, that's really interesting. I haven't thought about you know, image quality clearly will have an impact. Um, we're well out of time now. With um, So we'd like to thank you again, Ryan, for staying up so late and giving the, the talk and taking the time to diligently answer the questions. Um, to the audience for posting all these interesting and challenging questions. And before we close, come over to you for some quick final words and announcing our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, and thank you, Ryan, once again for this wonderful, wonderful talk and also a very good discussion. Uh, I, our audience actually covered all my questions, what I had in mind. A couple of them are left, but I'll, I'll talk to you directly, Ryan. <laughs> but they are like more naive questions rather than more uh, technical ones. So, okay. So with this, uh, I would like to close uh, today's uh, session. Uh, for our next week, speaker is uh, Professor... Sam Kreber from Imperial College London. So stay tuned and see you next week. See you all next week. And then we're back at the normal time because Sam is calling us from London. So thank yeah. you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See you next thank week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.